Maria, can you hear me? Yes. Um, just to be sure, um, when are we going to start with the still image and the, and the music uh, uh, for the LinkedIn? Uh, we start at the moment when we start with the webinar. Okay. Uh, I'll when... do two minutes of introduction, technical introduction in Zoom. Yes. And then I'll, let's let, let's agree. I will uh, uh, mm -hmm. And now let's start the streaming on LinkedIn. In questo momento. Ok, che... lì è il momento in cui sincronizzo, diciamo, faccio vedere sì. anche su LinkedIn. Ma sì. io chiedevo quando è che posso mandare la musichetta su LinkedIn con il. il con... Quando cominciamo? Quando comincio la interfaccia? Perché in LinkedIn sempre ci vogliono due o tre minuti perché così la gente. Sì, sì, no, no, era per capire se farlo anche prima perché io potrei farla andare già adesso la musichettina, però magari. Uh, no, no, è troppo, troppo. No, no, due o tre minuti prima. Mm. Va bene, ma okay. massimo fammi un cenno, tanto dovrebbe essere in concomitanza con quando facciamo entrare la gente qua. Circa, no? Infatti, e quando, okay, quando comincia perfetto. a entrare la gente lo, lo intendo. Lo perfetto, ok, va bene. Uh, scusami, una domanda. In, uh, sì. Ci sarà un slide che vedranno quelle persone dell'Inco? Quella dell che ti ho fatto vedere l'altro giorno, ah, okay, eh, che è quella di eh, francese e inglese, European Training Foundation, Comparing Regional Qualifications sì. Initiatives. Quella. Ok, un'altra domanda. Eh, quanto tempo uh, ci vuole per la, che la, la gente entri? Cioè, quando cominciamo a di welcome e tutto quanto voi mi fate sapere ti posso scrivere un... io in realtà mi metterei d'accordo adesso nel senso che da script io adesso aspetta che lo devo recuperare un secondo uh, non ricordo quando uh... sì, possiamo già andare avanti sì possiamo già andare avanti cioè già entrare fare entrare la gente Aren? sì sì però non è un po' presto No, abbiamo tantissima gente e vengono da molto lontano, allora non vedo un problema. Va bene, okay. allora... Comunque in script abbiamo detto dieci minuti prima. Quindi tra un paio di minuti iniziamo sì. a farli entrare, va bene? Così sì. siamo... Ok, sì. Va. sì, e quando entrano non ci vedono ancora, giusto? Quando loro entrano ci vedono se noi parliamo. Quelli su Zoom ci vedono, quelli su LinkedIn no. Ok, dunque sì, Arian, forse ci togliamo... E aspetto un messaggio privato quando siamo pronti di cominciare. Sì, no? va bene, ma io penso che se non ci av avvisiamo, secondo me per le 10, 10 e un minuto possiamo già iniziare a parlare qui su Zoom, con, così io appena tu parti a parlare mando il tappo su LinkedIn e poi quando tu dirai let's start with the live streaming, eh, sì. io collego e buona. Ok, però cioè, dico per uh, Arian, cominciamo in dieci, uh, alle 10 in punto, non importa chi c'è e chi non c'è o no? Ma uh, non, non è che li fate ammettere man mano, perché tutti insieme non, non si possono far uh, entrare. Tanto abbiamo al, momento, solo 13. Padre, al momento abbiamo solo otto persone. No, eh, per... In sala d'attesa. Io penso che possiamo già lasciare dentro. Tutti e eh, mostrare il slide, non PB share, ma quello slide, slide qui. Slide di zoom. Slide di zoom. Sì. Slide di zoom, sì. O slide delle cose, sì. Quello delle, con il titolo dell'evento. Arien, voi, cioè, se voi mi, mi dici tu quando comincio o no? Sì, io penso che non dobbiamo aspettare troppo. Cioè, ragazzi, se volete facciamo così, alle 10 in punto cominciamo. Tanto all'inizio saranno, uh, um, saranno le cose tecniche, no? Ma adesso possiamo già cominciare. Sì, il, sì, sì, no, dico di cominciare. Il chat, già... il chat si può cominciare, si può cominciare di, uh, di, di dire welcome sul chat, eccetera. Questo può cominciare adesso, non c'è problema. Ok, però dico l'evento, lo cominciamo alle 10 in punto, ok? Sì, evento comincia a 10 punto. Ok, dunque, uh, aspetto un messaggio diretto dal technical support. Va bene. Um, Maria, cominciamo e così so che andiamo. Va bene, a... alle 10 in punto io mando un messaggio Perfetto. In diretto. Perfetto. Intanto, eh, dico già a Francesco, possiamo iniziare a far entrare sì. le sì. persone in sala d'attesa? Sì, inizio ad ammettere le Va 11 bene. persone che al momento ci sono. Ok, grazie. Hello again, good morning, buongiorno. 
Kuhn from the European Commission. Yes, Kuhn, yeah. we have new, we have new, uh, we open a new for iedereen. Dus uh, in 10 minuten beginnen we. 9 minuten. Ik, ik ga unmuten en ik stop mijn video. Precies.
Aha, tady je pouze OK, co je to? Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we see you. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my Hello name dear. is Maria Alvova. I'm going to be the, the moderator of today's webinar. Mm -hmm. And welcome. This is the, the webinar on the regional qualifications frameworks organized by the European Training Foundation. Uh, we will be live on two platforms today. We have the multilingual webinar happening in Zoom here. And in a minute, we will also start the LinkedIn streaming in English. Um, before we start, just a couple of technical issues. Please make sure that your name and surname is correctly displayed on the screen. If not, please correct it. You can do so by opening the participants, finding your name, scrolling the mouse over your name, and then clicking on more. And there you will have the option to rename. So please do so. It will be very helpful for yourself and for us. Um, I would like to also to share with you that you have interpretation. We have interpretation in English and French. So uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will find the bottom interpretation where you can click on French or in English. And uh, probably you have seen the agenda for today. You can find it also in the chat. Uh, you can find the link to the ETF website 
where you can find the agenda and presentations in English and French. Um, also for your convenience, you will receive a link in the chat to the open space, which is an online community of experts working on the topic of qualifications. And there you will find uh, um, a link to the report on qualifications frameworks initiatives around the globe. The report is available in English and French. Um, so please use that. Um, I think at this uh, point, we can start the streaming on LinkedIn. We Hello? should be live. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Hello, welcome. Welcome to the online webinar on the regional qualifications frameworks organized by the European Training Foundation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, and uh, um, many countries have their national qualifications frameworks or NQFs. These frameworks can be used to help individuals, giving them access to different pathways in the learning process. But what are the regional qualifications frameworks or RQ, RQF, we will hear these abbreviations a lot today. What is happening with them and how many are there in the world? We're going to try to answer some of those questions today. Please send us your questions and we will answer them either during this event, there will be specific questions and answer sessions, or later on, so please make sure you reach out. Also, the recording of this meeting will be available on LinkedIn, so you can always come back and make your questions afterwards. Um, and I, last but not least, I would like to invite all the participants and all our followers to prepare your mobile phones. I have mine here ready, because we will have some interactive exercises happening uh, in a while. So please be ready to use your cell phones. And at this point, I'm happy to pass the floor to the director of the European Training Foundation, Mr. Cesare Onestini. Cesare, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, meeting and uh, to uh, see you uh, virtually all together uh, from different corners of the world. So it's a big pleasure for the European Training Foundation to host uh, this event. Uh, as many of you, I recognize some faces and names, are friends of ETF, uh, you know what we do, but I also see some uh, new names. Uh, so I would take this opportunity just to uh, uh, share with you that ETF is an agency of the European Union. Uh, we have uh, uh, almost 30 years of experience uh, working on supporting reforms of education and training systems in uh, countries outside of the European Union. And our main focus is on countries around the Mediterranean in the, to the east of the European Union, the Western Balkans, and what we call the Eastern Partnership, and in Central Asia. Uh, but the uh, um, core work of the ETF, it's about uh, the training systems, quality reforms, and uh, uh, supporting public authorities and providers in uh, uh, making sure that they give the best opportunities uh, to their citizens. And in that sense, our, uh, our work covers uh, all good practice all over the world. Um, in this context, the focus uh, for us is also on uh, qualifications uh, within what we call our knowledge hub. And this knowledge hub uh, of work on qualifications looks at uh, primarily the experience of the European qualification framework, uh, supporting the development of these uh, um, um, uh, of, the, of, of the partner countries around the EU, uh, connecting or developing their own uh, qualification frameworks uh, and uh, uh, taking also the uh, um, experience of the European countries and seeing the experience of the partner countries. Um, but we work very much in the international context, uh, as many of you know, and uh, we work hand in hand with the European Commission on this, uh, which uh, is uh, setting the policy guidelines. We work with uh, colleagues in SEDEFOP, we work with UNESCO, ASEM, uh, others. And in the past three years, we have been involved in supporting the African Union in uh, the development of the AC 
uh, QF. So the um, uh, European Training Foundation uh, is, uh, been, has been involved over many years uh, in these areas, and uh, uh, we have a strong team, you see, and you will hear from many of our colleagues uh, throughout uh, the, the meeting. Um, I will uh, let them to introduce themselves, but many of you uh, know them very well. Um, and um, the aim of the meeting today is really to share knowledge uh, and open a dialogue. We want to map the interests that you have uh, also from your different perspectives to see how we can support uh, this dialogue in the uh, uh, months and years uh, to come. Um, and the basis for this uh, first exchange is a study that we have done talking to many of you and looking at uh, where you are at in your experience and reflections on regional and national, but also regional qualification framework. Uh, why do we think this is important? Um, well, we see the value of qualification frameworks in our daily work. Uh, I uh, know I, I, I talk to a group uh, which needs no convincing, uh, but it's good to remind ourselves that really the uh, work that we do on qualification frameworks is very closely linked to uh, the uh, support that we give for the quality of learning, for the recognition, uh, and this uh, by definition goes also beyond borders. But it goes beyond that, and as many of you uh, know, and uh, as the study shows, there is also a close connection uh, between the uh, development of regional qualification frameworks and the goals of regional economic communities. Um, so there is a, a connection that is uh, 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 spreading out of the education and training field and also uh, supporting wider policy goals. Um, and in that sense, I think the uh, uh, experience sharing that we want to do can contribute to these wider goals uh, that we have. What is the starting point for the discussion today? The starting point uh, is really your experience uh, and your knowledge and uh, this uh, uh, um, sharing uh, and bringing together. Um, we also see uh, from the study uh, that will be shared that a lot of the uh, experiences are very different, but many challenges are common. And I think that's where it's interesting to compare notes. Um, we see also in this context that uh, uh, it, it's not easy that regional qualification frameworks uh, have uh, to different degrees challenges and find it difficult to progress beyond certain stages. So identi identifying these uh, roadblocks uh, and what is the challenge and seeing how they can be uh, overcome, I think it's also part of the knowledge sharing we want to uh, put uh, on the table uh, today. Another point I think which is uh, striking is that uh, when obviously we are rooted in the European qualification framework uh, as part of the uh, mandate of our agency here, but the work with uh, partners uh, around has showed us that there is also a different type of uh, challenges that we need to take into account when we look at low and middle income countries. Uh, there are different types of approaches that need to be looked at. And I think there, uh, comparing the experience uh, of the partner countries of ETF, which uh, around the EU cover very uh, diverse types of uh, training systems and economic development is also part of the richness of the discussion. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time to give the floor to uh, the experts and let them do uh, the talking. But from the ETF side, uh, please note that we are committed to continue supporting uh, this exchange and this dialogue. We uh, will be happy to see with you how best we can keep alive the discussion through uh, social media or other platforms in whichever way suits your needs and your policy goals. Um, and in, uh, our, uh, on our side, we will continue working very closely uh, with the colleagues. Uh, some of them will be here uh, today from the European Commission, from UNESCO, CEDEFOP and other international agencies. Uh, and we remain committed to supporting uh, important initiatives like the uh, African continental framework, uh, which uh, I think shows uh, uh, that when there is a will, uh, there is also the possibility to make fast progress. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a good progress in the conversation today.
Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cesare. I would like just before going next to our next point, I would like to remind to all of our uh, participants in Zoom to uh, put your name and surname. Please do so because we will need it for uh, an exercise that we will be doing in the working group. So please put your name and surname in, in, um, in Zoom. And now I would like to pass the floor to Kun Nomden from the Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion from the European Commission. Kun, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so thanks uh, for the ETF, to the ETF for having organized uh, this session this morning for those who are in Europe or if afternoon, evening, other time zones. And also again, this afternoon we will repeat. So my name is Kuhn Nomden. I'm working in the European Commission in DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. And uh, in there, I'm responsible for the team that is in charge of the EQF, of the EQF Advisory Group of validation of prior learning and also of career guidance. Now, Cesar mentioned uh, the role of the commission is in this context really to set the policy guidelines. And I would like to share with you some of these policy guidelines. And before I will also uh, say a few words about where we stand with the EQF and also about the external dimension of uh, the EQF, because this is the reason why we are here together. So in July of last year, the Commission adopted the European Skills Agenda. And this agenda focuses on skills actions in order to contribute to the green and digital transitions that are needed, but also, of course, on the skills contribution to get out of the current COVID-19 crisis that is affecting all our countries. And it puts also in practice, and I would like to mention this, the first principle of the European Pillar of Social Rights that is about access to education, training, and lifelong learning to everybody everywhere in the EU. And uh, this, of course, contributes also to the sustainable development goals, in particular, goal number four on quality education and lifelong learning. The European Union has that ambitious goals. By 2030, 60% of adults should participate in learning every year, and 80% of adults should have basic digital skills. And as part of the skills agenda, there are actions on re and upskilling, uh, digital skills, skills for the green transition, transversal skills, micro credentials, individual learning accounts, but of course also vocational education and training, European universities, to name a few areas. There are others uh, too. Now, the reason why we are together today is about regional qualifications frameworks and the external dimension of the European qualifications framework. And in this context, I would like also to refer to the adoption last year of a new pact on migration and asylum that is aiming at creating more efficient and fair migration processes. And uh, in this context, the launch of a talent partnerships is one of the key actions to develop sustainable legal pathways and attracting skills and talents also to the EU. And uh, these partnerships aim to contribute to engage partner countries on migration and provide a comprehensive policy framework, as well as funding support for a mutual beneficial cooperation. And also an EU talent pool is being explored, tailored to admit high skilled specialized uh, yeah people from, uh, from abroad. Now, in all of this, of course, qualifications play an important role. Uh, and, and we all know qualifications are important for employability, for access to fed education training, but they are also important, and this we should not forget, for personal achievement. Now, the key tool for qualifications in the EU is the European Qualifications Framework for Lifelong Learning in abbreviation, the EQF. Now, just a few words on the EQF and where we stand. So the EQF is the European reference framework for qualifications. It's a comprehensive framework. It covers all levels of qualifications. It's based on learning outcomes. Quality assurance is of course important. It covers all types of qualifications and also all levels. It covers higher education, vocational education, training, general education, but also it is open to qualifications from outside formal education and training. It's also open to validation of prior learning as a way to obtain a qualification and as the focus is on learning outcomes and not on duration 
or institution of learning. The EQF, and I think this is important to stress, is a framework for transparency. There is no automatic recognition, but transparency should of course make recognition easier. The EQF is also fully aligned with the framework for qualifications of the European higher education area. Now, since the start of the EQF in 2008, 35 European countries have related their national frameworks to the EQF through a process that we call referencing. Referencing is, of course, a continuous process. And currently, most of the work that we do concerns reviews and updates of referencing to keep the referencing up to date. In the longer term, the aim of the EQF is to create a comprehensive map of qualifications in Europe and really to create transparency at European level. And EU member states, for this purpose, are invited to interconnect their qualifications registers at European level through a new platform set up last year, the Europass platform. And uh, the EQF level should also become visible on new qualifications that are part of national frameworks. And uh, all of this will make the EQF and the related national frameworks better known in Europe, because one of the challenges we still have is that the general public, but also employers, are not yet fully aware of the EQF and of European NQFs. Now, the EQF, of course, as a tool does not stand alone. It's part of a broader set of transparency tools for skills and qualifications. And uh, to mention a few here, I would like to refer to the European Skills Classification, ESCO, the European Platform for Career Management and Lifelong Learning, which is Europass, and also the European Transparency Tools for Quality Assurance in higher education in that, and the European Credit Transfer and Accumulation System in higher education. Um, now, EU policies, all these tools support cooperation between EU countries. And this is because education and training itself is organized and the responsibility of each member state. A few words on the EQF external dimension. So the EQF aims at creating transparency of skills and qualifications at European level. But we are also working on the external dimension of the EQF to create transparency of qualifications for learners and workers across the globe. And this is why we are uh, here together today. A start uh, with this work was taken in the years 2014, 15, 16, when pilots took place to compare the EQF with Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. And in 2017, the EQF got a new legal mandate and the external dimension was then included. And the focus of the external dimension is on comparing the EQF with uh, qualifications frameworks outside the EQF area, both national frameworks and, and this is important, regional frameworks. A project group of the EQF advisory group was mandated in 2019 to work on possible criteria and procedures for comparing the EQF with qualification frameworks from other parts of the world. And comparison means treating those qualification framework as equal partners. Dialogue and mutual respect are key to this comparison exercise and also to wider cooperation surrounding it. Now, a comparison process should of course be done in a thorough way. And our group defined 11 possible topics for comparison. There needs to be solid documentation also dialogue to seek mutual understanding and trust. And finally, the process should result in a joint comparison uh, report that is published. And the overall purpose is to have more transparency of qualifications between the country or region concerned and the EQF countries. And like for the EQF, this will not result in automatic recognition of qualifications, but transparency can, of course, make recognition easier. As a result of the work so far, it was agreed to carry out three pilots to test the approach that we agreed in the group, namely one RQF, uh, the Southern African Development Community uh, Framework, and two national frameworks, uh, Ukraine and Morocco. Now, today's focus is on regional qualification frameworks. And it was clear in our work that when we started discussing RQFs, our level of actual knowledge of RQFs and how these are developing was quite limited. And the ETF, the European Training Foundation, quickly offered to carry out a study 
on regional frameworks in the world. And I would like to thank and also to congratulate the ETF and the researchers who carried out the study for the hard work and also for the clear overview uh, of RQFs that the study uh, provides. And you will see this, of course, in a few minutes. A last word about uh, EU funding. The EU is the biggest donor in the world and overcoming the COVID crisis is a need for all of us and uh, cooperation can help us to address common challenges in digitization of our qualification systems in addressing climate change and new instruments such as micro-credentials. And COVID has learned us new ways to connect and meet like today. Now in the past, the EU already funded many projects. A few examples are the SHARE project for the ASEAN region, the African Continental Qualifications Framework, in which the ETF is involved, the development also of frameworks in India, Bangladesh, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, Georgia, to mention a few, and furthermore, also the higher education framework for Central America. The focus of EU funding is very much on international partnerships. And currently, a new round of programming is starting, and in many countries, education and skills acquisition is a priority. Also, the Erasmus Plus program is offering opportunities for cooperation and RQF initiatives, for example, could make use of Erasmus Plus grants as full partner organizations if they partner with European uh, partners. And in this context, as you know, the European Training Foundation is supporting and is supporting more generally the external dimension of the EQF and is also ready to support exchange of experiences as it was also mentioned by Cesar. I would like to conclude um, and I would like to wish you a very interesting and fruitful session today. And I'm looking forward to our further discussions this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on your time zone. And I will also be part of the uh, breakout sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kun. So uh, now, dear participants, we are going to have an exercise. I, I would like to ask you to take your phones in your hands. And while you're taking them, I just want to quote some of the people coming here are from Portugal, Greece, Austria, Brussels, South Africa. I think we have Seychelles uh, in here and also a lot of people coming from different places on, on LinkedIn. So thanks for being with us today. Uh, I hope you have by this moment uh, your phone. Uh, so if you could please open uh, www.menti.com. That's the first step. Exactly. And you could dial the code 46227. You can also use your camera on your phone and scan the QR code that you can see on your screen right now. So I'll give you a minute to open your phones, either use QR code to scan it or opening www.menti.com. And we want to ask you one question. So how many regional qualifications frameworks exist? So how many are there in the world? We're talking about the, the globe. So how many regional qualifications frameworks initiatives, how many regional qualification framework exist? And for um, our followers on LinkedIn, you will find now the link to uh, uh, the Mentimeter as well. So you can get access it easier. So again, I will repeat the question. How many regional qualifications frameworks exist in the world? I'll give you one more minute. Results are on their way. Thank you. So how many regional qualifications frameworks initiatives exist in the world? Let's start with the number. If we can project already the first results, I think that would be excellent. Yes. Okay. So uh 
20 uh, participants said that over 20, so a lot. Uh, 24, 25 now saying that up to 18. And 11 people said that 12 now said that five. And, and at this point, I would like to, to ask Arjen Day. Arjen, uh, what do you think about those results? And, and please tell us the correct answer. <laughs> We don't really have actually uh, uh, a correct answer because the situation is constantly changing. But what we saw last year is that there were 17 initiatives. Of course, all of these are not existing frameworks, but we, we, this was considerably more than we had expected before. So, so definitely the number is growing and definitely it's also growing, especially in low and middle income countries in the Southern hemisphere. So that's very important, I think. Okay, thanks a lot, Aaron. So we know that at this exact moment there are 17, but the number is, is growing. Uh, I would like to ask also our technician, please put on the infographic, because I think uh, we have a very nice representation of what the world looks like in terms of uh, qualifications frameworks. So could you please put on the screen the infographic? Yes, they are coming. Thank you. I think the, the background that the Aaron has already discovers a bit of the secret of the answer. Yes, there, there you go. If you could put it the full screen, please. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the map that will be presented, I guess, by Aaron as well later on with the different geographical zones and the, the frameworks um, that are present. You will find the link to this uh, infographic also in the chat of this, of this webinar. At this point, I think I can pass the floor to Arjen to present you the regional qualifications framework around the globe. Arjen, the floor is yours. Yes, so now we're going to move first of all to the presentation. So if I can see the presentation, then uh, we can start. So first of all, I, I would like to say good morning to everybody. Uh, good morning and please keep your microphones closed. Uh, uh, my name is Arjen Day. I'm, I'm saying good morning because it's good morning in Torino, but of course uh, I know that there is uh, Princess Salai from, from uh, Fiji and, and for her it's already eight o'clock at the evening. Now I'm going really to start quickly with our presentation because it's quite a lot of numbers of slides that we're going to go through. So, uh, just please. Um, now, so the, to start with uh, our presentation, just, uh, sorry, sorry, just uh, one moment. I, yes. Uh, it's uh, this presentation I will make with Eduarda Castelbranco from ETF and also Monica Altsinger from 3S who has been helping us together with Julia Fellinger. But Julia is not here today. She gave birth two days, uh, two weeks ago to her daughter Aurelia. So on that positive note, let's start. Please write your questions in the chat in English or French. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, ah, you're, you're ahead of me actually. Uh, uh, what is uh, important is that our, our presentation has four blocks of topics. We start with an overview of the current RQF developments, and then we're gonna look at a number of comparative elements between the RQF initiatives. This is focusing mainly on the 15 initiatives that are outside the scope of the EQF and the qualification framework for the European higher education area. Then we zoom in on the African continental qualification framework in particular, because Africa is the continent with most of the RQFs and where our research coincided also with the mapping of the ACQF. And finally, uh, we look at how we could develop a dialogue between RQFs. And this is the introduction in the interactive session. So let's go to the objectives of our, uh, uh, of our study. We made this study uh, to map the latest RQF developments and to explore also the feasibility of comparison with EQF because uh, as Kuhn explained in the recommendation of 2017, 
this was foreseen as a possibility to explore the um, uh, comparison of the EQF with other NQFs and RQFs. So, uh, and of course, we, we, we lacked an understanding of RQFs. So, so we needed to look more at it, but we didn't have much time. So we could not have a comprehensive study. So what we really did is following a pragmatic approach. We, uh, we tried to find whatever was available online, but it was actually very limited. And then uh, we've been very uh, grateful for all the interviews that we have been holding with, with uh, many of you who are here today, so that you could provide us also with additional information. And also from these interviews itself, we got a lot of information. So that's what we have based our study on. The work was carried out last year between July and October. We have done some updates recently in December and January, uh, but of course, things are still developing. So let's go to the next slide. When we started this work in the summer of 2020, um, one thing that became quite evident early on in our research was that there are more RQF initiatives than we knew existed. Um, we were surprised actually by the, by the number and also extent of developments ongoing. Written information about regional qualification frameworks that is publicly available and also easily accessible is rather limited. So for most initiatives, but not all, and you hear a bit about that later, this study had to rely largely on interviews with stakeholders. And what we experienced in the research was an eagerness and also enthusiasm from stakeholders to participate in our study and also an openness of key informants to share also their challenges and, and struggles in their development processes. Without the support, as Arjen mentioned, we would not have been able to come up with this report. And this also shows, um, we believe, the potential for more dialogue on qualifications framework initiatives. This report seeks to stimulate thinking about comparison and possible linkages between RQFs. However, we also need to point out that given the nature of the evidence, um, our findings represent the snapshots of developments at a certain point in time, as Arian also mentioned. So this work is very much reflecting work in progress in terms of both understanding RQFs, the progress in developing RQF initiatives, and also exploring different forms of cooperation between them. Next. Yes, so uh, we're now going to start with the overview of the global RQFs initiative. So there was already a question of, of railing about this, and that's what we're going to address. Next. So we start with Europe. Europe is, was not part of the study, but we think to, for completeness, we, we, we have added it. There are two RQF initiatives that are very closely linked. They are interlinked. The European Qualification Frameworks for Lifelong Learning, and the qualification framework of the European area for higher education. Next. So the, the, this is already, Kuhn has already talked about this. The EQF uh, for, for lifelong learning is an eight level framework. And since Brexit, there are 38 countries involved in the EQF advisory group, which is the governing body for the EQF. The countries use 10 referencing criteria to relate their NQFs to the EQF. And 35 countries out of the 38 have already done that, and four already has presented an update of this report. Also, 31 countries include the EQF levels on certificates, diplomas, and supplements. And 15 countries have connected their national databases of qualifications through Europass. Next, the qualification framework of the European higher education area is part of the Bologna process to create a, a European higher education area. It includes 49 countries, which are mostly those of the EQF, plus the UK, and countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. The focus is on three cycles for higher education, so what we normally call bachelor, master, and doctorate cycles, as, as well as a short cycle as part of the first cycle. The vast majority of these countries, they combine their self-certification to this framework with the referencing to the EQF. So they had one report to address the referencing and self-certification. The RQF is very strong in terms of credit, ECTS, quality assurance, the European standards and guidelines, and recognition practices. Next. Let us continue with the initiative that is easily the most geographically dispersed of those we identified. Next, please. 
The Transnational Qualification Framework, in short TQF, is a 10-level framework that is intended as a translation instrument for the classification of qualifications between the 32 countries participating in the virtual university for small states of the Commonwealth. These so-called small states of the Commonwealth share some common challenges in the face of globalization and increased mobility of skilled professionals. Its major initial intent was to be a registration tool to enable countries to register their qualifications onto the framework and make them available to other small states. As the take up of the TQF so far is not as high as intended yet, work is currently ongoing to modernize and update the framework. Next, please. So let us now take a closer look at initiatives identified in the East Asia and Pacific region. Next. Our first initiative is the Pacific Qualifications Framework, in short PQF. It comprises the states of the Pacific Islands Forum. The PQF is a 10-level translation device to facilitate the comparability and recognition of Pacific qualifications. Countries without their own national qualifications framework may adopt the PQF as well. The PQF was set up through mutual agreement between the countries and also initially funded by the Australian Aid Program. And so far, a process of referencing to the PQF has been undertaken with four countries in total. There are three current priorities for the coming years for the framework. First is a review of the PQF. Second, having the PQF referenced against other regional qualifications frameworks and allowing for the cross offering of qualifications across countries in the regions so that a PQF country may make available its qualifications to other countries. Next. The ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, in short AQRF, is a common reference framework of eight levels that enables comparisons of education qualifications across particip participating ASEAN member states, with ASEAN, of course, meaning the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is an economic union of 10 member states. The AQRF, whose development started back in 2011, is first and foremost considered a quality assurance tool, using quality as a means to strengthen trust for mobility. So far, four countries have already undertaken their referencing to the AQRF, and the further three countries are ready or planning to undertake a formal referencing process in the near future. Next, please. So let us move now to take a closer look at the three initiatives um, identified in the Caribbean and Latin American region. So basically we um, move across the pond a little bit. Um, the most well-known, next please, is uh, the CARICOM Caribbean Community Qualifications Framework, which is a 10-level reference framework that seeks to act as a translation device that facilitates educational and labor market mobility across the CARICOM region and also supports career progression and lifelong learning in that region. CARICOM, by the way, has 15 full members from Antigua and Barbuda to Trinidad and Tobago. The CQF forms part of a long-term strategy in the region to establish a regional trade training and certification system, to harmonize national systems, to develop regional standards, and to finally establish a regional system for assessment, certification, and recognition of skills. One of the current priorities of the CQF are to get at least one quarter of the country's national qualifications frameworks aligned to the CQF by 2021. Next. The qualifications framework, next please. The qualifications framework, thank you, um, for higher education in Central America or MKESCA is an eight level framework of which currently the upper five levels are populated. This qualifications framework initiative is the product of two consecutive EU funded projects. And Kuhn has mentioned this uh, in his introduction. The initiative is led by the Council of Higher Education Institutions in the region, the Consejo Superior Universitario Centroamericano. It is a tool for quality assurance and recognition of studies between Central American countries. Um, so far, only pilot projects for a limited number of study programs have been undertaken, but there are plans to develop follow-up projects to expand the implementation of this regional qualifications framework and to receive funding for these initiatives. Next. And um, finally, in the Caribbean region, um, 
die and the, and the Central American, sorry, um, the Alianza Pacifico or Pacific Alliance is a Latin American trade bloc um, formed by four countries, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, which are the four full members of this bloc. Um, a dedicated working group is currently working on a proposal and a work plan for a regional qualifications framework initiative with the key objective, objective um, of supporting student and labor mobility in this region. Since 2020, so since last year, the Alianza Pacifico has received international support from colleges and institutes Canada, under which financial support is being provided for a two-year project, which is currently still ongoing. At the end of this two-year pro project and support, um, the aim is to have a proposal for a regional qualification framework initiative on the table. Next, please. <coughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, the Middle East and South Asia is a very interesting region from the point of view of archaeology, because here we really have a global workforce working in the Gulf. There's a strong link to migration, and also there's the issue of diversification of more added value economies. We saw last year that there was a, a big economic crisis, especially because of COVID, that hit this region. Many migrants went home, and there's a growing need also for ICT skills and switching to online learning and working in the region. Now we get to go to the next slide. The Gulf Qualifications Framework, the GQF, of the Gulf Cooperation Council involves Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They have launched a common market in 2008 and in 2014 in Riyadh, they agreed to develop an RQF. It's proposed to be a 10 level framework with mobility as a central goal, as it is linking all NQFs to the GQF, but also eventually to the EQF. There has been a delay in implementation due to a number of reasons. First of all, some countries didn't have yet an NQF. Princess Kuwait was the one, last one to develop an NQF. There's been some difficult relationships in the Gulf, but also of course the crisis caused by COVID has really had a big impact, a drop in GDP. And for instance, the National Qualification Authority in the UIA, which was in the lead for this RQF, they merged in July it, last year with the Ministry of Education. And it was very difficult for us to get information on where the progress is. So let's go to the next slide. The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation uh, include a lot of countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka that are sending countries. They send people to work, especially also in the Gulf. A feasibility study has been carried out for an RQF by the Swiss Agency for Development and the ILO Decent Work uh, Office in, in South Asia. Today, we have Gabriel Bardado here and also Andrea Bateman, Bateman who wrote the, the feasibility st study. This uh, framework is supposed to be linked with sustainable development, a cooperation in fact, but also with uh, the SARC plan for labor migration. And to give you a, a sense of the importance of the labor migration, there, are about, there were about 9 million Indian migrants working in the Gulf in 2018. So this is about harmonization of skills across the region, enable comparison of qualifications, and an eight level framework is proposed that should cover secondary education, VET, skills acquisition and higher education. And there is also a roadmap for implementation. And now the, the consultation is just ongoing. So let's go to the next initiative, which is the um, one which is not initiated by countries, but rather by organizations that are dealing with quality assurance. This is the Arab Qualifications Framework, which covers all the countries on the Arab Peninsula and also very many in Africa. Uh, and they are uh, all part of the Arab Network for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. The members are volunteering. It doesn't have governmental support. There's a strong focus on transparent mechanisms and quality assurance. And the AQF is offering external verification of NQFs and of qualifications. This has started as a higher education initiative, which was also in the name, but actually in the meanwhile, the countries have also said, we want to expand to general education and VET. 
And they are proposing a 10 level framework, but only higher education part is populated at the moment. There is an important impact of the current situation also on online learning that is going to change the approach of this framework. Now let's go to the next slide. Africa. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Eduardo Castelbranco. Africa, a, con a compact continent of 1.2 billion population and a large share of youth. This inventory identified six RQF initiatives with some similarities and differences. Four of them are related with regional economic communities. It is SADEC, ECOWAS, EAC, and IGAD. We will just, we will see them right after. One is linked with the Quality Assurance and Recognition Intergovernmental Body, CAMES. And one is the African Union's own Continental Qualifications Framework in development. If national qualifications frameworks are social constructs, then RQFs are constructs with important cultural dimension, given the diversity of cultures of education and training and concepts of qualification systems they interact with. We will uh, first move to Southern Africa, then to the West, and finally to the Eastern part of the continent. Next. SADEC, the Southern African Development Community is one of the largest regional economic communities in Africa with 16 member states and over 350 million population. SADEC qualifications framework is the most advanced RQF in Africa, established in 2011 by a political decision of the SADEC ministers and effectively launched in 2017 with the same with the name SADEC qualifications framework. It is a comprehensive RQF of eight levels. The SADEC qualifications framework is a regional mechanism for comparability and recognition of qualifications, credit transfer, creation of regional standards and facilitation of quality assurance. It comprises agreed principles, procedures, guidelines. The SADEC qualifications framework is implemented around six programs led by the member states on a rotational basis. These programs are alignment, quality assurance, verification, articulation, recognition of prior learning and credit accumulation and transfer system, advocacy and communication, and finally governance. For example, South Africa leads the alignment program. Currently, two national qualifications frameworks have aligned to South African to, to the SADEC qualifications framework, and these are South Africa and Seychelles qualifications framework. Mauritius has also submitted its alignment report. From the start of implementation, the technical committee of SADEC qualifications framework engaged in cooperation with other RQFs, notably with the EQF and ASEAN qualifications reference framework. Currently, the region is giving a new impetus to the SADEC qualifications framework with new measures to support implementation included in the Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan 2030 and also in the SADEC Labor Migration Action Plan 2025. This is very important. Next, CAMES, the African, the African and Malagasy Council for Higher Education or Le Conseil Africain et Malgache pour l'enseignement supérieur is an intergovernmental institution for the harmonization of policies and integration of the higher education systems of Western and Central Africa and the Indian Ocean. CAMESA's activities are backed by a regional quality assurance policy. 19 countries are members of CAMES. Uh, all but one are French speaking countries. CAMES is firstly a, quali a regional quality assurance and accreditation entity. But thanks to its program of recognition and equivalence of diplomas, Le PRED, and its quality assurance program, it can also be considered a regional qualifications framework in higher education. In respect to the implementation of the system Licence Master Doctorat, LMD, CAMES plays a role of support, advice, and monitoring. You can see the member states of these different qualifications frameworks looking at the color. So CAMES, the blue part. 
Next, please. ECOWAS. Now we go to West Africa. The economic community of West African states includes 15 member states with a population of approximately 400 million persons. The ECOWAS ministers of education have approved in October 2012 the guidelines and roadmap for establishment and implementation of national qualifications frameworks and regional qualifications framework. But the RQF of ECOWAS is not yet officially established according to our latest uh, information. In addition, in December 2018, ECOWAS validated a draft framework on the recognition and equivalence of higher education degrees. So this, this framework will offer a grid to analyze and recognize foreign qualifications at regional and national levels with the collaboration of designated agencies and of course in alignment with continental instruments, notably with the Addis Convention, Addis Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications. Next. EAC, East Africa Community. This is a smaller community with six member states. It's a dynamic and fairly well integrated regional economic community. In accordance with the treaty for the establishment of the EAC and with the common market protocol, the East African qualifications framework for higher education was adopted in 2015 by the Council of Ministers as a comprehensive framework of eight levels. And it works in complementarity with the regional quality assurance system. Implementation of the higher education part of the framework is governed by the Inter-University Council for East Africa, which is an inter-governmental institution of the community. The technical vocational part of the framework is currently undergoing further development. Important to notice that following the results of harmonization process in higher education in the region, the heads of state declared in 2017 the common higher education area of the East African community. And this is a very important milestone towards integration, mobility of learners and workers. Let me finish by saying that Article 11 of the EAC Common Market Protocol provides for the mobility of professionals within the EAC. And to facilitate this, the member states negotiate mutual recognition agreements in several professional domains. Next. So we continue now on the eastern part of the continent and we look now at the intergovernmental authority on development which is home to eight member states analysis and dialogue is underway towards development of a regional qualifications framework and this framework is expected to contribute to address the twin challenges of first developing adequate skills and competences and providing uh, relevant training for the region's very large young population. And second, and this is very important, providing skills and livelihood opportunities for the large number of migrants and ref refugees in the region. Uh, recently, very recently, end of April 2021, IGAD uh, held its first regional technical experts meeting on the Kampala Declaration of 2019 which is about jobs, livelihoods, and self-reliance for refugees, returnees, and host communities in the IGAD region. The Kampala Declaration promotes inclusion of refugees in national education systems, vocational training, and labor markets. Next. We will have a dedicated slot on the ACQF. So I've immediately passed the floor. Next. Thanks, Eduarda. Um, the global perspective. So we hope that this first glimpse at RQF initiatives across the globe has given you a first impression of the developments that are ongoing across the continents. Knowing, of course, that trying to sum up 17 initiatives in just over 15 minutes can only be a very incomplete affair. Next, please. What we hope that this first part of our presentation has given you a taste of is the breadth and scope of RQF initiatives to date. And this also takes us to the comparative element of our study on regional qualification frameworks. Next, please. 
As part of this study, we have set out to analyze and to compare these framework initiatives on the basis of a number of criteria, which can be summarized in terms of the following key questions. I've simply listed them here, but uh, we'll tell you a bit more about each of them in the following slides. It was not our intention to analyze each framework according to all these criteria. It was also a very small study after oh, yeah. all, <laughs> but to compare them and also to underpin some general observations with specific examples and to show how these features of regional qualifications frameworks might influence this comparison process, um, for instance, with the EQF. No. Next, please. The first question that we deal with is ownership and commitment of regional qualifications frameworks. So who are the owners and supporters of the initiatives and what are their resources and capacities for the development and the implementation of the initiative? One very important additional aspect refers to the support provided by donor organizations and international organizations. The question of ownership and commitment is an important one because one can assume that the role and capacity of the institutions behind the framework largely determine the progress and performance against defined objectives naturally. Um, we observed that the majority of the RQFs are part of regional communities, and you've heard that in the, in the presentation before. In some other cases, regional qualifications framework initiatives have been developed by non-state actors, for instance, in particular organizations of quality assurance agencies. Next, please. So what do these RQF initiatives seek to achieve? Are they more geared, for instance, towards promoting free movement of people and integration, or rather more towards quality assurance in education and training, or do they have other purposes in mind altogether? We can broadly identify the following objectives that RQF initiatives generally want to achieve. First, to promote the mobility of workers and learners. Mobility and migration, of course, plays an important role in many of these initiatives. Arian has mentioned this before, also in the Asia and Arab migration context, for instance. Second, um, quality assurance for mutually trusted qualifications as a broad aim. And third, transparency and comparability of qualifications together with increased harmonization. These broad objectives are not mutually exclusive and most RQFs indeed have more than one single objective. Although it is indeed possible to distinguish different initiatives according to the primary focus. I mentioned before that the majority of RQFs are part of regional economic communities. So in many cases, the policy framework and the objectives of these RQFs are of course closely tied to the objectives of the economic communities. Next, please. If we take a look at the scope of the initiatives. So this is asking about, do they cover all types of qualifications or do they focus on certain areas like technical vocational education only or higher education only? Or do they focus on certain levels only? To what extent do they address the aspect of lifelong learning or refer to arrangements for the validation of non-formal and informal learning? Our research has shown that the scope of RQFs varies. Some initially focused either on higher education or on vocational education and training, but we also see a clear trend towards comprehensive or unified frameworks. And this means that they are designed in a way to include, or at least potentially include, qualifications from various levels, from primary education to PhD level, and also various sectors of education and training. RQFs are generally based on the concept of learning outcomes, and as regards the number of levels in a framework, we observe a prevalence of 10 level frameworks across the globe. Next, please. Yes, yeah, so where are they now in their implementation? Say the FOP and ETF, they developed a common set of stages for qualification framework, starting for, from exploration, what kind of framework we want, designing the qualification framework to adoption, activation, and becoming fully operational. This is followed by a review of frameworks often, and then the whole cycle starts again with redesign, readoption, etc. I will provide a link on our joint paper in the chat. Um, uh, it's not the right link. Sorry, uh, it's not uh, formally published yet. Uh, NQFs and RQFs develop in parallel, and they can strengthen each other. 
Most RQFs are not fully operational, considering that NQFs in the regions are not yet connected to the RQF. So that's really important for us. And what we saw in, the, in our work is that only the AQRF and the SADEC qualification frameworks have really advanced quite a lot in, in the area of referencing or aligning. So, so they are the ones with which we can now compare. Next. Are there links between the individual regional qualifications frameworks? Yes, absolutely. RQFs often have links with other RQFs, for instance, in terms of common members. To name just very one example is Trinidad and Tobago, which is both part of the CQF, the CARICOM qualifications framework, but also covered by the scope of the transnational qualifications framework, the TQF. So this is just one, one simple example of, of, of one of these linkages. The figure you can see here shows you the key linkages between the different RQF initiatives in terms of their geographic coverage. It does not intend to be super accurate. It probably cannot be in one slide, but it simply seeks to give you the bigger picture by emphasizing the global perspective between, between, behind these developments and also the potential outreach. Indeed, many key informants do, during our research emphasize their interest in more dialogue with other regional qualifications frameworks, both for the purpose of mutual learning and also for sharing experience, but also with regard to labor migration. Next, please. Yes, so uh, when we look now at the, uh, at, at the, the, the situation, if we compare the countries and where can we share actually our experiences, so we see that our, every RQF tries to offer a fit for purpose solution. So they're not one copy of each other, but what was very clear in the discussions we had last year is that uh, there is quite a big interest in sharing and mutual learning. And also uh, we have identified five C's that are very important, I think. The first one is the COVID-19 response. COVID really has met a crisis for all the globe. It's a global crisis. And also many countries are middle income countries and low income countries, and they're facing a slowdown of developments. Then a second uh, area of uh, interest are common qualifications. We have seen in the Caribbean, for instance, that they have Caribbean vocational qualifications, which even predate the, the Caribbean qualification framework. And other frameworks are also aiming to develop those common qualifications. Climate change and green growth. Uh, there, uh, the TQF and the PQF, they really are uh, advanced. They have already developed common courses on how to address climate change and green growth. Catalogs, database and qualifications. The PQF is linked with the a specific uh, register of qualification standards as a repository of quality assured qualifications in the region. So they have one register. And also they will integrate micro credentials, common guidelines. There are many frameworks that are developing common guidelines. SADAC has common guidelines on quality assurance, recognition of qualifications, credit accumulation and pretend for. The ACQF is developing a lot of guidelines. Also in the EQF, we have guidelines uh, and the ACM qualifications reference framework has a new guidelines for instance, on referencing just uh, adopted. So there are a lot of issues we can share. Next. So um, the EQF is not the global standard. The RQFs that are existing are not copies of the EQF. Every RQF is unique. So many RQF initiatives are benchmarked against the EQF. The EQF has been inspiring others, but they are not copied. So comparison that is now uh, uh, on the, uh, as a possibility possible, that, that of course uh, creates an important opportunity to connect the RQFs. And uh, there's a strong interest in cooperation with the EQF and other RQFs are going beyond uh, only just linking the levels. There is actually an interest in ex experience sharing, ex interest in recognition of qualifications. And for instance, in the EQF, we have developed Europass and ESCO as tools to understand qualifications better, to link them through a digital uh, tool. And actually that is where also many other frameworks are going. So more recognition because of uh, digital technologies, because of our ability to compare qualifications and to, have, uh, to move from a paper-based uh, recognition system to much more one that is electronic. 
And this also offers opportunities for uh, uh, interoperable systems that can be used also for guidance and counseling and for other purposes. So there are many communalities and there is scope for more dialogue. Next. So if we look at the feasibility of comparison, uh, we've already talked about it quite a lot. So the EQF comparison is based on dialogue. It is not comparing to the EQF in the sense that the EQF is the standard. Uh, the, both frameworks need to be equal and therefore there needs to be a dialogue. But the dialogue needs to be based on common interests. And the EQF comparison is open for operational qualification framework as we said. Because most frameworks are in early stage of development, and because many also have difficulties to advance, especially in COVID, we think it's important that we look also at other forms of cooperation. We are going to start piloting the comparison of the EQF with the SADAC qualification framework. And next year, we hope that we can share the experiences. Also, uh, during the development of the EQF, we've been discussing other forms of collaboration, but this was not the mandate of the group. So we have not advanced very much in it. And we actually need your inputs in order to decide where we're gonna focus on in our joint cooperation. Now, let us first look at the ACQF, which is really an example of dialogue and cooperation. Next. The African Continental Qualifications Framework, ACQF. This is the future largest RQF, it's in development. Next. Uh, the ACQF will be the largest of the regional qualifications frameworks as it cooperates with 55 countries and eight regional economic communities. In fact, it is the only RQF in interacting with two different levels, the national and regional. Enablers and opportunities of the ACQF relate with the demographic dividend of the continent, projected advances in human development, the significant flagship policies and strategies for continental integration related with the African Union Agenda 2063, and especially free trade, free movement of persons, the continental education strategy for Africa. But also those strategies promoting the green recovery and digital transformation. And most importantly, there is a growing number of national qualifications frameworks in development and in consultation, as well as those that are already approved and advancing in implementation. But this is very important to note, the continent is facing important challenges and the education crisis is one of the most pressing priorities. The EU is an important partner of the African Union supporting most of the indicated strategies and policies. Next. We just said it, development of the ACQF is backed by all critical African Union policies listed here, and you will have time to get better acquainted. Next. The vision for this ACQF is to enhance comparability, quality, and transparency of qualifications from all subsectors and levels of education of education and training, supporting people's lifelong learning outcomes to facilitate recognition of diplomas and certificates and mobility of learners and workers to work in complementarity and in cooperation with national and regional qualifications frameworks and support the creation of a common African education space and promote cooperation and alignment between qualifications frameworks, national, regional, in Africa and worldwide. Next. The principles of the ACQF are inclusiveness, innovation readiness, openness to users, stakeholders needs, and of course, a global cooperation. Next. Next. Development of the ACQF is uh, underway. Uh, it, is, it started in, to, in September 2019 and will go on until end 2022. This process is supported by the European Union through the Skills for Youth Employability Program, carried out in partnership with GIZ and European Training Foundation and with involvement of all stakeholders. Next. 
the ACQF policy and technical document with action plan and a set of technical guidelines and tools, including a website, is the package planned uh, of the planned outputs of this work. Uh, it's also important to notice the, 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 the place of capacity development and networking uh, in the ACQF project activities. Next. The ACQF mapping study was the first step of the project. It represents a, a substantial contribution to an updated knowledge base on qualifications frameworks in Africa. The process involved 41 countries through the online survey, technical country visits, peer learning activities, and the review process of all reports. I'd like to greet James Kivi, Andrea Bateman, Jean Adotevi here present today. I think we did a great job together on the ACQF mapping study. Next. The mapping study is more than a report. It's a collection of 13 country reports, three regional reports, and a comprehensive continental analysis in three different formats. Next. The mapping study identified, let's say, a rather favorable uh, situation in terms of qualifications frameworks on the continent. So 21 qualifications frameworks, and these are national as well as sectoral, for example, higher education or TVET, are adopted or in implementation, plus 18 in development, consultation, and early thinking. Two RQFs are also in implementation. So this is a, a favorable starting basis for the future ACQF. I think we all remember in 2008, so 12 years ago, when the EQF was adopted, entered into uh, function, there were three only national qualifications frameworks in Europe. Next. Capacity development and networking. Next. The capacity, the capacity development 2021 is resuming on 3rd of June with a combination of modalities of learning. We will have five peer learning activities between June and October, a conference in December, and also a relatively in-depth training program of five days. Next. Uh, in 2020, you, many of you remember and many of you participated, uh, the project, the ACQF project successfully carried out a dynamic program of seven peer learning activities between July and October. And here on the screen, you can see all the countries and all the experiences that were shared. So next, these peer learning activities shared, gathered, 22 cases of qualifications frameworks from three continents, Africa, Asia, Europe. 17 national qualifications frameworks and five RQFs share their experience, their plans and challenges. All this information is gathered uh, in ETF open space for now before it goes then to the ACQF website. Next and final, next. In the meanwhile, the options or scenarios for the ACQF development have been proposed and validated by the second ACQF advisory group meeting that took place on 8th of April 2021 as a basis for further development. These three options offer, offer a perspective uh, of the way forward in the next five years, more or less. So, Scenario one is, we call it uh, ACQF Connects. The focus is on peer sharing, capacity development, benchmarking, common tools. Scenario two, ACQF creates mutual trust. The focus is on referencing alignment and support to recognition of qualifications, recognition of prior learning, qualifications databases. And then a, most, a more advanced Scenario is always at scenario three, ACQF opens new horizons, more ambitious, where ACQF as a continental overarching framework 
has continental qualifications profiles, automatic um, mutual recognition of qualifications, digital credentials, and hopefully contributing both to global transparency as well as to internationalization of African qualifications. Thank you. Next. Sorry, I have to unmute. So it's, it, this is the last slide and we've, we've passed a whole presentation as far as we could make it short because of course there's a lot of information. Uh, but to conclude, our, our presentation uh, it was based on the fact that we can see an enormous amount of, of developments. RQFs are really gaining importance. We see more initiatives and we see also more RQFs becoming operational. But we have to also consider that they need capacities. They need resources and time to develop. And often they, these are lacking. So that makes these initiatives vulnerable. There's a balance requirement uh, a need, a balance uh, development need, of course. RQFs, of course, are based on what's happening in the region, first of all. So of course, there needs to be a strong development of the countries in the region to develop them. But we can also consider that there are many issues that can be addressed in cooperation with, with the wider world, with other RQFs. We have all learned to work online and physical distances are really less important than before. We are conscious of common challenges and we can benefit from regular sharing of information, sharing of data, of experiences, of expertise. And we are ready in ETF to support this process as a catalyst, as a facilitator, not as the organizer. Everybody will have to play its role. But what we would like to discuss now is how can we take this, this uh, finding forward? The, the fact that there are all these initiatives happening, sometimes in isolation, sometimes in, in connection, how can we make this uh, cooperation more effective? But before we're going to discuss that, I would like to give the floor for questions, both from LinkedIn as well as from Zoom. So I'm really for, looking forward now to get the questions from the participants. And I saw already in the chat, there were some comments, uh, but there were not so many questions yet. So please, if you have any questions, this is your opportunity. Please put them in the chat. Arjen. Yes. Uh, there were a couple of comments, not that much question, but comments from LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, one please. was from John April from South Africa. Uh, he wrote that it's interesting that a growing there's a growing number of initiatives uh, on, on qualifications across the world. That was one comment. I don't know if you want to say something about it. Uh, about it. Yes, I also saw in the, a, a comment from uh, Nigel Lloyd who said, uh, the, uh, "Why is the U.S. and Canada why they were not mentioned? Of course, these are there are initiatives in these countries. Of course, in the case." of the US, this is a private initiative, yeah, where we have a degree structure that has been agreed, that is used by different uh, regional uh, quality assurance agencies, but that is not national. But it's also not regional because the US is one country. In that case, we should also have considered the Australian qualification frameworks, a, a regional framework. For us, this is a national framework. The same in Canada. We know that there are provincial uh, qualification frameworks, for instance, in Quebec and in, in another uh, provinces. And we also know that there is an initiative to bring these together. We have not considered this as a regional framework, but that's a matter, of course, of, uh, of um, uh, understanding and interpretation. But overall, there are, there are really uh, developments. Now, I can see some, some questions coming here. Where, okay. And there's immediately an answer. <laughs> so there was a question, were le level descriptors compared? If so, did the study come to any conclusion? And then James Keevy has already uh, uh, presented here the study on level descriptors. There's also been a, a study on level descriptors in Europe done by CEDEFOP. Of course, these level descriptors are also changing because I've seen, for instance, in our countries, the countries where we work, sometimes they start with one set of level descriptors that after some time, they, they are uh, developing other ones. For instance, in Ukraine, we had 
um, 10 levels, then 11 levels. Now we have eight levels. The descriptors are changing in, in, in Moldova. I have two different sets of levels. So, so there, is a, there is a development. In, in South Africa, there were first eight levels. Now there are 10 levels. So, so uh, level descriptors are not fixed, but level descriptors, uh, we have not compared all the level descriptors of all these countries. But it definitely is going to be part of the exercise when we're going to do comparison. Arian. So uh, Eduarda just wrote that uh, level descriptors were compared in the ACQF mapping study. Arian, there is also another question from LinkedIn uh, from Robert Buiz. I'm sorry if I'm spelling that wrongly. Uh, what is the role of UNESCO in parentheses ESCAD standards? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, UNESCO is developing a new initiative which is based on learning outcomes, that is the world reference levels. So uh, UNESCO colleagues are hopefully, they are, they are here, I think, with us and they could possibly give information on that. The idea is there, also John Hart is here, I've seen, he's been the, the father of this system. So, so these, these levels are, let's say, neutral. They are not system bound, they are not region bound and they have been developed to compare learning outcome statements of levels for, for different purposes. Then, uh, but these are not yet adopted, they're not yet implemented, they're not yet uh, used widely. Uh, then uh, we have, of course, the ISCAT levels, which also in the last revision of ISCAT were very much influenced by the EQF levels. That's why we moved also to eight ISCAT levels. However, they are based on different criteria. They also want to take account of learning outcomes, but they're not learning outcome statements per se. They're still based on uh, education programs uh, with their duration, rather than on, on real learning outcome statements, which are important for recognizing lifelong learning, which are important also for putting smaller uh, qualifications, which become more and more important into these frameworks. Okay, then there is a, this is a comment, I think. Um, can we go back to the, so there is a, a relationship between levels and socioeconomic investments made by the countries and the development of qualification frameworks in those settings. Yeah, of course, uh, levels, they do often uh, uh, reflect somehow also the values that are important. In, in different countries, but, but we have not been looking at these to this detail. This has not been a comprehensive study in that sense. There is a really a lot of things that we still need to work on. So, so uh, of course, there was the, the level study some years ago. Now, of course, we have realized that there are many more uh, RQF initiatives. So we will need to look at these things. Okay, then um, a question. What are the organizations that lead the development of RQFs? We have been looking at this. This has been an aspect of our, our work. We didn't look in it in very much detail, but if you look at the, uh, the, in the study, there are country descriptions. And these country descriptions, they really also cover the governance aspects. And these governance aspects, they are quite different. So, so for instance, on the, on the Southern African Development Community Framework, there, is a, there are different committees working at different levels, more technical, more policy oriented, and they work together. So it's really important that whatever questions you have, we are going to address them. But we need to also be aware, I think, of the time that we have, so actually, I would like to give the floor back to Maria now to uh, do another Mentimeter exercise. And then after that, you will be guided into breakout rooms. In these breakout rooms, we would like you to discuss the cooperation uh, that we could establish, could develop between the different RQFs. And we have defined two questions, which will be introduced uh, by the facilitators in the breakout rooms. Then after those breakout rooms, we will come back here to have the conclusions of our uh, 
discussions. Now, I would really like to give the floor back to Maria so that we can move forward as soon as possible. Yes, thanks Thank a lot. Thanks a lot, Aden. So again, dear colleagues, please take your phones with you. And it's the same exercise as it was before. Please open them www.menti.com. You can see now also the QR code on your screen. So you can just open your camera on your phone, put it in front of the QR code and you will be led automatic automatically to the Mentimeter. You can also uh, see now in the chat, both in LinkedIn and in uh, um, uh, Zoom, the link to the survey. I will give you one minute to open it up. And the question is, why do you think regional qualifications frameworks important? Why are RQFs important? And there are several answers for cooperation on qualifications in the region, for global transparency of qualifications, for easier portability and mobility in the region, and to support the development of national qualification frameworks, NQFs. So again, if you could open Mentimeter and answer the question, why are RQFs important? And in a minute, I think we can project, yeah, the results. So 45 people said that RQFs are important for easier portability and mobility in the region. And the next popular, the next uh, most responded option is for global transparency of qualifications. And then the other two have similar amount of votes. So to support development of NQFs and for cooperation on qualifications in the region have both 9% of votes. Arjen, anything to comment on the results? I think we have two winners here with equal uh, amount of votes. It's very interesting to see that people look beyond their regions and they look at global transparency of qualifications, not only within their own region. So, so it's clear that those RQFs have a function even that go outside the region. So that's very interesting. And that also helps us to now move to the next uh, part of our, of our discussion where you will be active. So let's go to the breakout rooms. Okay, Arjen, do you want to announce uh, or we go? Okay, we go directly. And for our LinkedIn followers, please stay here because one of the working groups will stay with you. Okay, so uh, welcome in this work, uh, breakout room. Um, I don't know if everybody has arrived here already in my room. Can I think see? people are still coming. Maybe one minute more, add in. Yes, people are still coming and joining. Also, while we wait, if uh, our LinkedIn followers would like to participate in this conversation and make their questions, please post them on, on LinkedIn chat. Thank you. So if we are now complete, can I just send to all of you a link? I'm sorry. So welcome to this group. I hope we are all here. Um, can I check if that's the case? Could you please open your cameras? Because we are not so many now. We're still assigning some uh, participants to the working workout rooms. Okay. okay. So maybe just one more minute. Yeah. Arjen, maybe for those that are here for the moment, can you tell us what, what is this link? Yes, so, so uh, what we're going to do now is an exercise where we're going to look at two questions. And uh, you will be guided to, this, uh, to these questions by this link. It will take you to a canvas 
where you will be asked to answer these questions. So the first question has to do with how, what do you see as the main constraints, the main issues that we could address together? So what are the main constraints that you see for your framework? So those people, I see a lot of people from the, from the EQF. How do you, what do you see those issues that we could address together with other colleagues? But I see also Princess Franz Herze, he's from the, he's active in the transnational qualification framework and in the SADC qualification framework. We have also Howard Davis here from the UK. He's very active internationally in higher education. So, so please uh, click on the mural and it will take you automatically to another top. So if you can do that, And then you enter as a visitor. I see a lot of uh, pointers coming. So I think people are in the, in the board. So uh, why do we have a question in Spanish here? <laughs> Let me go back to the room, the first room. Okay, this is our room. Sorry, uh, could you please uh, press on the top outline, room one, uh, morning, English. Have you found it? So it's turquoise color. It's really light, light blue. Yes. So BO room, morning English. Are you there? Okay, now, please, uh, if you want to write on one of these e posts, so you just click on them and you can write on them. If you, uh, so we want you to answer the first question and please answer, write one post-it. What is the most pressing need for the RQF you are involved in that could be addressed through international cooperation with other RQFs? So please uh, just click on them and type. If you have any difficulties, please talk because it's difficult to see the chat now. Have you arrived? I, can, yeah, I, I can see, see nobody writing. No, yes, no, people, yes, people started to write, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, our work with re recognition would be helped with more referencing. Okay, so that's the first one. Please, only the first question. I'll give you three more minutes and then we're going back to Zoom. So far, only one input. So go to room one, morning English, yeah? So it's on the top, on the right, on the outline. And you write, yes, I have a second one. The establishment of RQF databases similar to the EQF qualification data set register. So that's also a common issue. Anybody else? I see a lot of activity, but I don't see a lot of writing. There's another one coming, I didn't. Yes, there's another one coming. Cooperation among RQF should be a meta level, at meta level, otherwise it is getting too complicated.
Any other points? I see Salai, you're, you're here with us. Please, when we had a discussion, you indicated some issues also. Just click on the, on the whatever post that you want to have. And you want to have another, another uh, post that you can create one also by double clicking. And please write, just type in them. Also, Heidi, I see that you are there. You have a lot of experience from Saqwa and from the from from Sadek. Database on different comprehension of qualifications, okay? Different education systems and qualifications brought together. Okay. Establish a common understanding. Now people are starting to write. So let's take one more minute. Okay, can, can we just conclude here? Maybe we just take one, let's go click on, below on your screen, you have the uh, Zoom. But if you if there is anybody who would like to say something, please raise your hand. You can do that uh, in the reactions under in your screen. Just Kathy, say raise hand. It would yeah. be a good idea maybe to open the floor so people maybe want to comment on that. Exactly. Advice, so, so who would like to who would like to say something? Can I ask somebody maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, Paulette, you you were you, I see that you're there and you have been involved in the Caribbean framework right from the start. Would you like to comment? Uh, Dennis, hello. Dennis, you have to close your your uh, microphone. No. Can I ask anybody else? Anybody who wants to speak, just open your microphone. I see Sean watching, but and Wolfgang. Please I can say something, Arjan, if you like. Yes, please. Uh, well, I wrote on the post-it note uh, about from the recognition perspective. Uh, we, when we receive, uh, so we evaluate applications for recognition in Sweden, about 30,000 per year. And when we, when we receive those from people from countries where there's an NQF reference to the EQF, it, it gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of recognizing it in Sweden. And we can push down the minimum limit, move towards recognition of micro qualifications. Um, perhaps even move towards recognition of non-formal learning if it's recognized in, the, in the, the member state that they're coming from. So we'd of course like to see from a recognition perspective more uh, of these regional net uh, NQFs uh, referencing somehow to the EQF or at least from individual NQFs referencing to the EQF. And we, we see that with, I believe, uh, some non-member states and that that's useful in terms of international mobility and recognition.
add in your mic. Can I ask somebody else? Howard, would you be able to say something or maybe uh, um, Paulette from the Caribbean? Could we have somebody from the other frameworks? I saw Salai earlier, but I don't see her here in the overview, so. Okay, this is this is Paulette. Yes, please. I'm sorry, it's it's very early in the morning. So <laughs> but um one of the challenges we have been having in the Caribbean is is communication and a lack of understanding among the, the various territories. Uh, some territories have national qualification frameworks, some are just developing. But um, the CARICOM qualifications framework is the regional qualification framework, is, is sorry, is the, is the regional framework. But um, there's lack of uh, interconnectivity um, between the NQFs and the RQFs. So, um, and things have kind of stalled in, in the Caribbean. So um, in going forward, one of the things that I would like to see happen in the region is a, a, a body coming together to review the, the RQF. Um, it was developed in 2012 and things have really just stalled. So how can we get things moving again? I think that is, that is where we are in the Caribbean. Thank you, thank you. And do you see any role there of others, for instance, of the European colleagues would we help you with these things? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just in touch with the CARICOM um, Commission. Uh, but again, I think the lack of knowledge or the lack of resources uh, is, is hampering the, the, the progress. But we would really like to see um, greater connectivity or, or greater communication or you know, tapping into the ETF uh, in going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sean, uh, when you talked about recognition, were you talking only about higher education qualifications, which is often the field where there is, uh, or, or also about vocational? And how do you see the role of frameworks in, in promoting recognition of vocational qualifications? No, I, I, the main challenge actually lies with vocational qualifications. The higher recognition of higher education degrees typically is uh, more straightforward and easier for us. What's more challenging is to recognize uh, vocational qualifications, whether they're at a secondary or post-secondary or sector level, because we don't necessarily have a similar comparison object in Sweden. With higher education, we usually have bachelor, master, PhD, from in the entire world. So it's, it's a lot easier. So it's the main benefit uh, with, with potential referencing between NQFs and the EQF, for example, is for vocational qualifications. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next question because time is around. So we go back to the mural and we try to answer the next question. So if you are still, uh, if you use the link, go again to the top, yeah. If you use uh, and and go to the bio room one. So I can see others are really. So Aaron, the second question is. Yes, yeah, so the second question is, how would you be prepared to contribute to cooperation between RQFs, you personally, or your organization, or your framework? Yeah, you could answer all those levels. So I have here a comment, understanding of the challenges of the RQFs, of an RQF. So is that, is that 
that's probably more question one than question two, or not? To bring experience of the Netherlands. Ah, this is Tails, Tails, I hope, yeah? So, so that's very good. Uh, are there any other people who are uh, ready to, to really volunteer? And now I see also we have much more still issues there <coughs> on the other one. Please go to question two because our time is limited. I will put this. Uh... So I have here another one. Might be useful with more information regulated. Can I, I, I have to. <coughs> On regulated professions, are on regulated Yes, professions. on regulated professions. This is also an issue that is, of course, very important. And where there are a lot of regulations that are national even, not even regional. In Europe, we have a very complex system for that. So please... Uh, Add your comments with my training in adult education and experience in the field. And there is a, and I see also there's a very small one there in one of the, <laughs> please, uh, you can make your uh, posters larger by just clicking on them and enlarging them. Yeah, so there is there a very small one. Can we move that and make it bigger? Because. <laughs> Yes, okay. Oh, but it's a double one, I see. So, uh, just to remind also to our LinkedIn followers, I didn't, maybe while we are waiting for more input that you can click on the uh, on the link that uh, uh, you will find in the chat on the collaborative board and participate in this exercise as well thank you yes and, and we give uh, people still uh, one minute and then we really need to have our final discussion because yep. we will be thrown out of this room soon no we will stay actually in this room we will others stay will join room. yes we, then we have six minutes left. Okay, six minutes left. So we need about five for discussions. So in a minute, please. Just click on the on uh, on any post that you see and just write on it. Might be useful with more information on regulated professions that we've seen already. Referencing NQFs to RQF. So th that, of course, is an issue all our uh, RQFs are, are dealing with. Of course, sometimes it's not called referencing. Sometimes it's called alignment. For instance, in the case of South Africa uh, or the Southern African Development Community. Uh, and and also sometimes it's, it's based on quite different principles. For instance, there are new guidelines now in the... Uh, in the uh, AQRF that were actually developed because they started with an approach that was very much uh, close to what we had in the EQF and then changed the approach. Be part of a dialogue and contribute experience. I mean, I can say for myself, I've been working uh, in a lot of countries and actually every country you're in, the conditions are different. The, the issues are different and it really helps you to uh, to get a different view on what you can do 
with the qualification framework, how to move it forward, how to uh, implement them more effectively. And we have also been de developing a number of, of, of guides for NQFs on how to help them with implementation. But I, I think didn't... other organizations also have done it. Let's go back now to the uh, to the discussion. So, who can I give the floor? There was somebody who was <laughs> Cynthia. You are, and I'm very happy you're here. Actually, hi Arjen. Hi, <laughs> you're from the AQRF. Did you yes. did you write I'm anything about, specific? I'm, no, I'm no longer with AQRF, but I have a colleague here, still a member of the of the committee. So did you write anything specific on what you see as a possible role? So I, I, well, well, in our case, it's really helping uh, because we still have some of our AQRF uh, members who are not yet referenced. So whatever help we can give because we've finished the referencing process and then maybe uh, exchange with some of our colleagues from the other RQFs. So, uh, so referencing is, is really the issue for you? For us, yes. To, to move beyond the four countries that you have done. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think here is a similar question of Dr. Uh, Kebebe Kasa from EGAT. The challenge for RQS is how to establish consensus from member states on how to harmonize. Of course, harmonization in the European context is a very difficult word. Okay, I see that Jorgos is already here. Are we, in, uh, are we all together now? Yes, I, th I think this is the plenary now, Ari. Okay. Is that correct? Well, in 30 seconds, the uh, breakout room uh, uh, will be closed. So from okay, my group, then. colleagues are, are now connected with, with plenary. So we've done our our, our job. Whenever yes, you I want, I can we... share my screen. Uh, we miss other groups. So maybe 30 seconds more, and then we... Continue. But maybe, Joros, you can maybe share your screen for a second. Then we can see what, what you have done in your group. Okay, I'm doing that now. Okay, share screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Very impressive. You've done really yes. a lot. We didn't manage to group everything. Sorry for that. But uh, I'm not a specialist myself. So um, colleagues started doing it themselves by changing the colors. So some of them you see they are grouped. Um, but I, I, I think that would be your input more too. We are, we are going to analyze all of this and bring it, bring it together in a, in a joint report. And then we, we will come back because actually this is just a start of a, of a discussion. Okay, so, so uh, Joros, can you unshare so that we can start with the conclusion section of our, because we are we're really running out of time. Could I have the, the PowerPoint presentation? For yes, the conclusions? conclusions? Yes. So, so as we we said, I mean, of course, we need we need to draw this to a close because we said we will do this for two hours, and it's it's two hours out of everybody's agenda. So we'll try to stick to time. Uh, what I think is very important, can we next go to the next uh, slide? Is that we now move from ideas to action. So how are we going to move forward? Of course, there are already a number of initiatives that are supporting uh, uh, RQFs. Uh, either within a framework like the ACQF or within a framework like the World Reference Levels Group, which is as established by UNESCO. Of course, those can be also maybe better used and we can maybe see how we can involve others in those. But also there are uh, other initiatives that will need to be developed from the ground up uh, where we will need to uh, facilitate, uh, share information, etc. So if we can now go to the next slide. Uh, the, a, a very critical point for every, every framework is COVID. It really has forced us to rethink how we work, how we learn and how we recognize learning. Uh, we have all started to co-work online and this of course is a huge opportunity in a global setting because we can now do things that were impossible by having to travel from all the countries. But we also see that COVID has really affected the economies, all the economies, and it was a topic in every discussion that we had with the RQFs. And we can see actually that public budgets for qualifications have gone down. For instance, 
We've seen very recently how SACWA has really uh, 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 um, become much smaller. And also we've seen how the, the golf qualification framework has had difficulty to develop, also because of lack of support, lack of... Uh, so, so what is the role of uh, RQFs in COVID recovery? Can we go to the next slide? Uh, first of all, we have to understand what is the role of qualifications, and that's often misunderstood. Uh, also in my own organization, but I think everywhere, people see qualifications as a technical topic. So, so at one hand, we have new needs from the labor market, from society, from individuals developing. On the other hand, we need to change the provision. We need to, way, we need to change the way we learn. There are new ways of learning, much more individualized, there is an education training provision. And how is this often done? This is often done through qualification. So qualifications have a very important uh, bridging role. Of course, they also have a signaling role in saying what kind of qualification people have. They have an important role. They are part of every system. And I don't think any parent would send their kids to study something for which they would not get a qualification. So they do matter. But this needs to be understood by people. So next slide. Of course, when we look at uh, 2021, we are in a year of transition. We are not yet completely out of the COVID situation. We are, but we have to think about it. We have to prepare ourselves. So let's click on the next one. So one of the things is that half of us will need to reskill in the next five years. This is the double disruption that has happened because of the economic impact. Many people have to completely relearn new jobs. So there's a huge no, uh, need for upskilling and reskilling. And the pandemics really change the way we work, but also what we work on. The next one. Also successful reskilling starts from knowing what skills are needed. So both right now and in the near future, offering tailored learning approaches to meet them and evaluating what does and does not work. And here we need to also exchange more information. We've seen that there has been experimenting around micro-credentials. We've seen, for instance, that uh, green and skills, they have been a, a, a really addressed by some of the frameworks, in, uh, the transnational qualification frameworks, the, the Pacific qualification frameworks. These are really very valuable developments. They are the future for all of us. Next, sorry. Then, of course, what we also see is that the public sector needs to provide stronger support for reskilling, upskilling. But of course, often this is a problem because they don't have the resources. So there is especially also a role for equity and inclusion. And qualifications are play a role in equity and inclusion because they actually provide a common, uh, 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 especially if they're national qualifications, a minimal threshold that everybody will need to, need to meet. So let's go to the next one. Now, qualification frameworks, they can be part of this transformation. They could address the post-COVID challenges and opportunities. They could be part of building back better, building back better, making our systems more, more uh, uh, ready for the future. Uh, a lot of people are going to change uh, jobs. Transitions have already become much more common than they were before, but this becomes even stronger in the future. So for that, they will need to have some kind of uh, uh, proof of what they what they're able of. So also, there is a lot of interplay between RQFs and NQFs, where we can, uh, we can actually exchange experiences in better addressing the post COVID crisis. So let's go to the next one. So what are the opportunities for RQFs? First of all, of course, the situation doesn't look too good. There are, there are limited resources, it seems, available. But on the other hand, COVID-19 offers an unprecedented uh, opportunities because it's global, because we have to also find global solutions between ourselves. So we're talking about large-scale so solutions that can address the needs of many NQFs. We talk about sharing common knowledge, and we call, talk about also uh, uh, regional impacts. The RQFs are not very regulatory tools. They are more part of soft power. So this is about 
active players in crisis recovery. So what can we do to reskill people? How can we help that? How can we recognize that? Uh, how can we support learning? How can we make people innovation ready? Uh, uh, how can we use digitalization? So let's go to the last, last uh, slide. So it's all about cooperation. We are in this together. So how can we share experiences? We have to share more experiences. Uh, we have to remove the, the boundaries and the barriers between our frameworks. We're often in boxes. And actually this cooperation can help us to overcome those. For instance, in Europe, we have very specific limitations because of the legislation of the EU, which really makes a lot of the issues on qualifications a national responsibility. So everybody needs to be on board and we can learn from other, other regions how they resolve these issues. Could we have a joint plan of action? Could we have a joint project with resources? For instance, one of the things that was mentioned by this morning was that actually a lot of planning for EU support and the EU is the largest donor in the world is actually starting now for the next years. And next year also the Erasmus program will be open for projects that could address uh, uh, qualification frameworks worldwide in which everybody would be able to, to participate. So we need to see how we can deal with that. So we could see also if we can have a joint platform. We are offering a joint platform on open space. So this is the time now because there is no time and our time is really up here as well. So can I just have the last slide? So if you then all open your cameras, yeah, and uh, we stop sharing and, and just uh, let's all greet each other and let's be uh, complete this, this, this global get together uh, and, and I really want to thank everybody for being here because this is really unique. We really have people here that are, are, are really on the other side of the globe of where I'm sitting now. And I really think that is very important. We could only start what we wanted to, what, what we wanted to discuss here. We need to dialogue between all of us. And uh, we are going to go back to you after this event. We're going to go give you the links and we hope that we will be able to start uh, a real dialogue in which we also want people to pledge their own support because we need to do this together. This cannot be put forward by, by one organization only. Thank you very much for attending. Those who are really interested to follow another session, we are going to start again at 16.30, but I think- Only in Zoom this case. So we will Only also, I would Zoom. like to thank all our LinkedIn followers who stayed with us for all of the duration of this session. Thank you so much. This afternoon, the focus will be more on the, on the Americas. So uh, thank you very much for participating. And I hope to see you all soon. Stay well. And I please send us your ideas after this event. I know it was impossible to get, capture every, everything, but we will get back to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, Colleen. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye Eduarda. Wonderful to connect. Hi. Hi, 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 Yes, I wait yes, for you on Monday. Thank you. Uh, olá, sim, sim, claro, não, não se preocupe. Olá, vou ver se agora, agora consigo. Hã? Vou mandar um e-mail. Bom, está bem, ok. Obrigado, obrigado. Tchau. Tá bem, obrigado. Salam, salam, tchau. Salam. Tchau. Olá, vou por ler o meu e-mail. <risos> ok, obrigado. Não, 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 não. Obrigado. Falca. <laughs> Dr. Kebele Picasso, we would really like to have a meeting with you. I, 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 I put my email and I think I'll, I'll follow up with this one. Sorry, I okay. came late. I had another meeting. I just had to wrap. It's okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm already, I'm already, Thank you. I'm Thank you for participating.
it looks like as, as nobody wants to leave the, the meeting. Huh? <laughs>